so the key message out of, out of quit planning, um, apart from take, let's take it seriously, and, and so what that means is, like, I know there's lots of people in the room who are not in, not in clinical practice, but like you, you have a powerful influence on clinical practice, so let's get this message out there. Um, recruiting in healthcare settings increases, these, these are two evidence-based statements. Recruiting in healthcare settings increases success. Um, there is more success from recruiting in a healthcare setting than, than in any other setting. Uh, and a combination of prescribing and behavioural support is the most effective. Those are, those are the two, um, two key comments. Um, and so that's based on this, this slide here is um, based on information in the um, uh, information drawn from the Cochrane Collaborative. Uh, so that's lots of, lots of research in different, um, in, in, uh, different RCTs and so forth have been brought together into one, one slide. This is from the um, New Zealand guidelines. So you can, you can find this slide um, very easily. And basically um, what it shows is that um, the orange one is active treatment, uh, and the um, the control or placebo is the is the pink. So there's a, two two comments that come out of this. The first is that um, as you go up, all the lines get longer. In other words, the most successful um, there is some success from um, providing any kind of support, but when you when you go up to providing NRT, it's a lot more, um, and when you prescribe medications, it's a lot more with varenicline being being the most effective. Um, so. Uh, there is a sort of a, a ladder that you can go up in terms of effectiveness. Um, the, what the um, placebo control shows here is that if you're providing support, it, even if you're providing support without actually active treatment, it is, it is of help. So behavioural support is, is um, helpful in itself when combined with appropriate medication, particularly um, NOT or prescribed medication, it has a double effect. So we want both um, we want both prescribing and support to go together. Um, the um, per reason for um, doing this, obviously, is we have to treat the addiction, the cravings and withdrawal, and we have to treat the smoking behaviour, which is to do with motivation, commitment and affirmation. So um, these are the two items that, that actually need, need to be addressed. So what's happening at the moment? Um, these are units of prescription and the top line here is NRT. There's lots of NRT out there. Um, unfortunately, quite a lot of it not used at the level we've just had explained to us. So there's a lot of wasted NRT because people aren't using it appropriately. So a lot more of this um, NRT could be effective, but you can see there's a lot being prescribed. Very low levels of medication prescribing. So one of the things that's happening is that we've got medications which are very effective at stopping craving and at um, reducing interest in smoking, that's particularly varenicline, and, and, and at very low levels of prescribing. And um, some of the reasons around that are just opportunities not being taken, lack of confidence in the medication, um, and beliefs about that medication that are based on historic concerns that have now been invalidated. So one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to look at how we get the message out there in primary care that we should be prescribing more. Um, obviously we want to do this in safe ways, and if you're in a service, one of the things that you can do is to is to um, go back to the practices and say, here is someone that we've been working with, they have been unsuccessful with NRT, um, I would like them to be considered for a trial of medication. And that all comes down to the quality of the relationships that you have with, with service and about the integration process. So our, our, obviously our goal is to match smokers with the best option. So um, I'm talking about clinicians here, so like obviously if someone walks into your stop smoking service, you're matching them with NRT, but even within that, as Rosie has, has identified, there are many different ways in which you can give NRT, so there's still a lot of matching and personalising that you've got to do. For me as a clinician, um, I want to check, actually, um, should they be revisiting NRT, should they be going to a stop smoking service and actually using the stuff properly? Um, uh, because this is actually the safest of all medications with the, f with the fewest side effects, and it's effective, so um, if that's an option, we should be encouraging people to do that. Um, and if the prior use was inadequate, then I, then I suggest that. The guide to prescribing NRT in the national guidelines is very good. It's, it's, it's well worth a read if you haven't read it. Um, it's a succinct summary of how you go about prescribing NRT. For clinicians, if we're not going to use NRT, if, if um, uh, we offer uh, bupropion or varenicline is basically um, the way ahead. Uh, we want to ensure that there's good medication counselling around that, so clearly when we talk about those medications, we are prescribing, we're doing the same thing that we're doing for any other 
medication. Um, we're going to talk about um, the benefits of the medication and the potential adverse effects and any instructions on how to use that. And so there is medication counselling that is required. Um, it's necessary to have early follow-up um, to preempt problems. Um, so um, it's no different. I, I, my, you know, my sense is you have to kind of think about it as you do with those other kinds of medications where you know it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, you know. Um, and I think back to the days when the only medication we had for depression was tricyclic, anti tricyclic antidepressants, and we had to start low and ease the dose up slowly, and there weren't really very nice medications to take at the beginning. It took you a while to get used to them, and yet we got people onto those medications because they were beneficial, um, and we did it by um, ensuring that we saw them early to get to pre and follow up. So it's the same generic approach. We don't want people dumped onto varenicline or bupropion and told, here's your three months script, away you go. Um, the the uh, um, likelihood of them staying on that is very low. We know from national data around the use of, of varenicline, for example, that um, you need a 12 week course to finish and that um, only about 60% um, get to four weeks and only about 30% get to eight weeks. So we know a lot of people are falling off and that's unnecessary because they're not getting the benefit from the medication. So active follow up is needed and um, I think anybody who is prescribing needs to have a decision about how they're going to do active follow-up and you want to have decided about this before you do the prescription. So a practice needs a plan around this because there has to be follow-up either I'm going to take responsibility for this person's smoking cessation and I'm going to follow them up and there are some people where the relationship between me and them is such that I need to do that. They're not going to go to anybody else so I'm going to see them and work with them and I'm going to commit to that process. Um, but for many people within a practice there will be a system so there will be a nurse that is um, appropriately set up to run a cessation program and that's the person that they should be referring to. And if that's not the case, then they should be referring to the local service or to Quitline. So there are, there are options, but not to have an option for follow-up is not appropriate. But somebody has to be following up on the medication. So as well as the behavioural support, there needs to be a planned follow-up around the medication because the medications potentially can have side effects and, and that needs to be monitored. And I don't think that we would prescribe most medications without follow-up, and yet for some reason this, this is kind of out there that it's OK to do that. Um, so, as I'll come to in a minute, I don't do very much behavioural follow-up myself. So, um, the way that we do it in, in our practice is that we've got a couple of outboxes that contain information. So, when I'm giving, um, when I'm doing the medication counselling, um, one of your options is to go to the um, uh, to the MIMS and check that list, or to go to the full checklist of the medications and go through things. I've made a summary as an outbox just from those documents. When I print that outbox, it automatically sets a task. Um, I'm, I have a, a reputation as being a person who delegates quite a lot, um, so that task doesn't go to me, it goes to somebody else. Uh, so it's, there's a designated um, nurse that has that task that automatically is triggered. So I don't, if I print this out box describing here's how you take Zyban, here's how you take Champix, it automatically will go onto that and then a week later that person will get that message to contact the person and um, check in if there are any side effects or concerns. Now, if, I've, if I'm dealing with a tricky situation where I've got other medications involved, I'll bring, I actually make an appointment and bring them back because I want to be responsible. But for somebody who is otherwise healthy, has no other medications, um, then all I want to know is that they're being contacted about the medication to check, have you got any concerns, how's it going and so forth. So it's about a personalised follow-up. So, uh, I think we're not doing anything different here to what we do with all the other consultations that we do. Um, we need to normalise this as part of routine general practice and in general practice when you start a medication you work out what's the appropriate thing for that person. So for some people it's to see them the next day, for some people it's done to see them for two weeks, for some people say they might have tried Champix a year ago, it didn't work, they're in a different headspace now, they know it's going to work, there's no side effects, they say, look, I just need the medication. Um, I'll say, we'll check in with you, but here's a three-month script, you know. So it's, um, um, there's no absolute rule. It's about what's the decision and what's right for this person, and you negotiate that. But as a rule of thumb, I would be, if I'm starting a person on a medication that's potentially going to have side effects, I would be wanting to know that within a few days to a week myself, yeah. Um, but what we don't want is people just started on it and, and no follow-up at all. So, we, so this is different from the behavioural follow-up. This is actually the medication follow-up. We have to have some process there. And let's not forget, nortriptyline is still an option. 
Um, it's uh, as effective as bupropion. Well, triptyline works fine. You just got to do what we used to do for depression in the old days. You got to start low and ease into it very slowly. People will tolerate it very often if you do that, and we use it a lot for pain management and so forth. So it's the same kind of process. Can I ask a question? You know, when you um, commence to bigger train and there's pop-up boxes, which I know we'll complain about, but you have to answer those pop-up yes. boxes. Well. I'm, here's me, I'm committed, I'm motivated to look and see that. I've dealt with people with a three month script for jam books and done that. Yeah, I'd love to have a pop-up box. The, the problem is they're incredibly expensive to get organised. That's the difficulty. So you need to have some system, and it really, it's, it's a practice level to system. So this is what I mean about a plan. You, you need a plan not just for the individual, but you need a plan for the practice. In, within the practice, there needs to be decided, how do we do smoking cessation in this practice? And so that it's easy. You don't want to be deciding when you've got the person, you want to have decided in advance, you know? Yeah, so to set up some process. Now, I don't mind if the process ab absolutely is, I will prescribe the medication, see them once, and then expect um, Quitline to manage that subsequently. Because, you know, with the drop-down boxes that you've got to send notes to Quitline, there's a, there's a space there in free text, you can write in there what you want them to do. So you, we've got options in that, in that space. But I think there just needs to be a process. The most sophisticated process, I think, is that there's a, definitely a clinical follow-up and there's a separate behavioural follow-up. So uh, if we're starting them on bupropion, um, which uh, is, fr is uh, freely available without restriction, um, so there's no rules around having to start on this medication, it's generally recommended that you um, start one to two weeks prior to the quit date. Again, it's personalised. You work out what's right for that person, but generally speaking, you have the medication in for one to two weeks. Um, continue six to 12 weeks, um, so usually I, I usually go for at least three months, um, but longer for relapse prevention, and that's, that's the key there. Um, Champix is restricted to uh, funding for three months per year. They're not very effective for relapse prevention, um, except the research supports um, relapse prevention by Champix. Um, uh, there's a little bit of research supporting um, the use of uh, bupropion for relapse prevention. It's not as strong, but this is this is uh, seriously an option if you've got somebody that is uh, at risk of relapse. And I guess negotiate that with the person, really, um, and work out what how long we're going to do that for. Um, I usually just advise them about the common side effects when I have the outbox that just talks about that, but uh, the alternative is just to go through, um, I mean, if you're prescribing, you just open up the MIMS and, and you've got the, the short list there, or you can go to the full list and, and go through that with people. I think, like, our... our Detailing around this is a discussion, a conversation. It's not just a handout. I, I think this is beyond just here's a few simple things on a handout that you need that you need to know about. Um, the thing we do have to consider with bupropion is, is the risk of seizure. This is the main um, concern, that it lowers the seizure threshold. So if there are other medications that change seizure thresholds, um, then you need to think about that. So, you know, if they've, if they've had like head injury or um, other... Um, uh, problems with the brain that may change the risk of, um, of seizure, um, alcohol is another one to think about. Um, but you can look at that in MedSafe and I always do go through that and just make sure um, that they're not on any, mother, any other medication. So a lot of people that we're prescribing for are not on anything else. It's very straightforward. If they're not on other medications, that's actually a pretty straightforward consult really. But if they're on other medications, I actually do a checklist and just say let's check your other medications um, just to be sure they're not on the list that might change, um, change that seizure threshold. It's liver metabolised so again other medications can increase the dose. Um, and so, um, and, and it can impact also on the um, levels of those others. I just check the MedSafe list again. I mean, I don't think anyone can remember all of these no. things. The other things so, are eating disorders as well. It's yeah, not really so I haven't mentioned that. I mean, obviously, if you've got, I have to say, I've never dealt with smoking cessation in somebody with an eating disorder, but um, you know, it's always listed as one of the things, yeah, isn't it? It must be pretty what's uncommon. What's it listed in? If somebody had an eating disorder, yeah, diabetes. It increases the risk of, of uh, seizures. In that, in that yeah. Yeah. Um, Julie's going to talk a little bit more about off-road prescribing stuff. Great, that's cool. So the, all, the stuff's, all that stuff's coming up, great. Um, BP can sometimes increase um, if you're using NIT as well, um, usually, but sometimes even without using NIT. So um, I check the blood pressure at the follow-up. And um, I work uh, in, uh, in my mainstream practice, but I also do clinical director duties in a high-needs practice. 
um, where people come in and see different doctors and different nurses and I'm often quite surprised at how often you see somebody and actually the blood pressure wasn't checked. It's just because of the busyness of the place and people get distracted by what they're doing, you know, we, we, we tend to focus on the issue. So um, we do need to have a system for making sure that the basics are, are being addressed uh, because you can get an increase in blood pressure along with this and uh, obviously we check it before they start and then at the follow up as well. Um, you can use it with other SSRIs, um, so it's a, uh, you know, Bupropion was originally developed as an antidepressant, it's related to SSRIs, so it's not actually directly SSRI, but, but if I did that, I would be um, starting on a low dose and I would be um, just doing close follow-up. And that's no different what you would do for, for any other medication. So the message here really is that this is a very good medication, um, it's, it's uh, effective, it helps people to quit smoking, like any other medication, you just need to apply the standard rules about ensuring that you do appropriate follow-up. Um, that's an example of the MedSafe report. So it, like, it's very easy these days to get these MedSafe reports. I mean, if you can't get it directly through your PMS, you just Google MedSafe Bupropion and that's the page that comes up. You know, it's like it's, there's no time delays anymore. So um, it, um, it goes all through that information and it's quite reasonable to go through that with the patient. Um, so that you've, you're having the discussion around actual data that you can share together. Um, so the other one is Varenicline. Um, the, as you know, um, we can only prescribe three months at a time and you have to have had two um, attempts to quit using other approaches. Um, those can just, they, they can be two NRT attempts or an NRT and a, and a Zyban um, process. There will be very many people uh, around now who haven't had actually two quits attempt before, so pretty well available for us to use. And you have to fill out the special authority process to get that. Um, it works by reducing, oh, I did mention about bupropion, um, no one's actually completely 100% sure how it works. I mean, it somehow reduces cravings but the actual chemistry of why that works in the same way is not fully known. But here we know that um, this blocks the nicotinic um, receptors and so therefore reduces the severity of withdrawal and it reduces the rewarding properties as well. So, um, you know, what I tell people is that um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you with the withdrawal process but you're actually not going to want to smoke. Um, and it's an amazing number of people that um, sometimes like start at least one week prior to quitting, the number of people that come in and we have already quit, you know, because it just actually lost interest. It's really quite phenomenal, um, that, that process. And you use it for a total of 12 weeks, and it's, um, the success is very definitively related to the duration of use. So um, uh, eight weeks is way better than four weeks, and 12 weeks is way better than eight weeks, and 24 weeks is way better than 12 weeks, but we can't do 24 weeks unless you've got somebody who's willing to pay for it. It's pretty expensive. I think that would probably cost about three or $400, but I have had patients for whom this is such an important issue they have been willing to pay um, to, stay on, to stay on that. And we forget that sometimes people will put their money where they want it to be, uh, certainly less expensive than smoking, um, and I had people that want to do that. So it's um, paid to remember that if there's someone who's really struggling and, and wants a definitive way of preventing relapse. Um, common side effects, as you know, is um, nausea and the vivid dreams. Um, I think the use of language that Rosie highlighted there, I didn't realise that before, you know, like nightmares is a bad word, vivid dreams is not a bad word. Um, so <laughs> sometimes it's about how you say things, isn't it, you know? Um, so I hear that gives me nightmares. Oh, it doesn't give you nightmares, it gives you vivid dreams, you know? <laughs> um, it's quite clever, isn't it? Um, uh, so nausea, you take it with food, obviously. Um, you can reduce um, the dose. Um, um, it's still effective at a, at a lower dose. Um, so... Uh, that's why it's the starter pack starts with a very low dose, and you can just stay on the starter dose for, for a lot longer um, and, and reduce that. It's not liver metabolised, so there's no issue there. You do have to reduce the dose in severe renal impairment. I mean, you're not often in that situation. Most of the people we're using it for have not got a lot of other pathology going on at the stage that we're using it, um, but we just you have to know about that. So, um, again, it's just something that you can look up the MedSafe or, or MIMS data on. Um, can change the dose frequently, uh, dose and frequency reduce side effects. So um, once again, you can have um, half a dose four times a day rather than one dose twice a day. You've got, you've got options. Um, you can have the whole dose at night. Um, there's a, a variety of things that you can experiment with to do that. Um, setting a quit date is considered best practice, um, but some people just do it gradually and it's okay. So you have to do whatever works for that person. 
So, so for some people, like actually having a quit date gives them a goal to work towards. Uh, the worry I always have about actually having a quit date is if they, if they actually like start smoking after that date, then they're in a negative state. Sometimes with this medication, if you, you give it long enough, they will actually just um, just stop. So my my practice is not to set the quit date at the first, and sometimes not even at the second appointment, in the expectation that they will just stop in any case. But I think that's again a personalisation of the process. Um, you do whatever is the appropriate thing. Um, it's okay to use in depression and with people on SSRIs and other mental health conditions, but caution. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, in the next slide. Um, but uh, the, I don't think the caution is any more than any other prescribing that we do. There's nothing um, different about this medication from anything else. When, when you have somebody on other medications and you're adding a new medication in, you have to be cautious and you have to look at the potential side effects. You can't know them all, so it pays to check. And I think that's a very appropriate thing to do. But I just want to um, talk about the Eagle study. Um, very brief comment about it, but um, if you haven't looked at the study, um, it's just if you just Google Eagle study, you get this study. Um, I think it's it's a kind of a landmark smoking cessation study. Um, so it's definitely worth a little bit of time reading this. I've got a couple of slides on it um, because um, it looked at what what there was a concern about was um, does renaclean cause um, neuropsychiatric complications, uh, and and can you use it in patients with mental health history? So so we have a significant part of our of our um, population affected by um, moderate to severe mental health problems um, where the smoking rates can be as high as 40, 60, even 80 per cent um, and some of those people we, we are going to be able to help with um, um, nicotine braced approaches including vaping to quit but some are going to need this medication so we need to think okay is it okay to use that um, so what that um, study showed was that there was no increase a neuropsychiatric adverse effects attributed to either varenicline or bupropion relative to nicotine patch or placebo. So there were adverse effects, but they were actually no more. Now that was actually quite surprising. It's a very good study. It's been commented on many times in the literature. Um, I think that, that gives us a lot of confidence about prescribing. Um, it was m uh, more effective than placebo, nicotine patches and bupropion in helping smokers to achieve abstinence. Um, bupropion and nicotine patches were more effective than placebo. So it really validated the approaches that we've been taking and I think um, therefore a very useful, um, very useful um, study to have a look at. Um, so they looked at a cohort of, of patients with mental health diagnoses and a cohort of patients without mental health diagnoses and they tracked the side effects for um, Champix, Bupropion, NRT and placebo um, and um, these are the neuropsychiatric side effects and you can see there's no statistical difference uh, in the patient with mental health group and uh, there were certainly lower side effects in people that had no prior psychiatric symptoms but no significant difference between the different products. So again it's about the individual we monitor, that's how, that's how we do it. But I think this has given us a lot of confidence around actually prescribing this medication. So I'm, I'm um, a, a, a big prescriber of medication to help people quit, um, but I watch people closely. Excuse me, I don't feel confident yet, because what are, are the neuropsychiatric side effects? I mean, I presume it's agitation-y type things, and I'm frightened that I'm going to induce a seizure, and then I've lost it, but once they have a fit, then they're going to bad mouth Champix or Bupropion yep. and all that kind of stuff, and bad mouth me, and then I'm not going to get a job at yep. the practice again. That's the reality of how I feel. Yeah. So I think the way to, first of all, I would just suggest get the study and read it because yes, it, it's yes. definitely a really good study and I think it will give you some confidence. Secondly, it's not that there were no side effects, it's that the side effects were not, were not significantly different between the different groups. So we do need to know about those side effects. Um, the Champix not particularly associated with seizures as a side effect. So, so your risk there is actually very, very low. Um, and uh, again, that is about management. So it's not that you gloss over those. You, you, you look at the list of side effects, you discuss them. It has to be informed consent for the, for the taking of this medication. Um, but most of the people you're going to prescribe them for are not going to be at risk. For those that are at risk, you obviously need to have a discussion. But that's no different from anything else that you do. And then I think what you do is you watch them closely.
Okay? So the way, to, the way to avoid negative reactions to people is, to, is so that you and that person are working together with this medication to help them gain something for their health that you're both aware of there are potential issues. Um, so that it's not a surprise. And when people are, in a sense, um, bad-mouthing the doctor or the practice or the product, it's because they were not expecting those things that, that might happen. No? Yeah, we can chat more about this um, subsequently, that would be fine. Um, and this is just the uh, information about the effectiveness. So looking at the use of um, each of the products, um, this is the um, uh, 9 to 12 week follow-up and this is the 9 to 24 week follow-up. So this is actually much more important because this is the long, um, the long, the long term ones. So in the patients with mental health history, um, you can see the difference. There's the 18% um, um, uh, quit rate uh, for Champix, 13% um, for bupropion, um, thir and 13% for NRT and 8% for, so your placebo group, obviously there's people that got support. So you can see that there is an effectiveness here, and this is in a large group of people. Um, so we know we increase the effectiveness if we give support and if that support is done within the right sort of settings. And you'll know yourself that you can get much higher quit rates than this if you are involved in providing the support in a primary care general practice setting for the medication where you have this relationship with the patient and you're involving a behavioural support in the appropriate way. So just, I'd encourage you to have a look through that study. It's an easy study to read, it's very available online and I think it um, gives us a lot of confidence around prescribing. Um, so what do um, relapse prevention, because relapse is a significant issue. You saw the relapse there between um, 9 to 12 weeks and 12 to 24 weeks, quite significant. And we all know from our services that lots of people quit at four, at four weeks, but then we pick them up in the practice and they've started again. Um, uh, so the basic outcome of the Cochrane review is actually there isn't a lot that works well for relapse prevention. But what does work is the strongest is um, interventions that focus on identifying and resolving tempting situations. Now you'd expect that. Um, so that's something that we, one of the behavioural supports that we want to put in place, how to um, avoid situations and resolve situations in which you might be triggered for smoking again. Um, and extended treatment with Varenicline has got an evidence base. There's no evidence base for bupropion, but there's no real reason why that wouldn't work. We can't prescribe that, so um, I do prescribe that for relapse prevention. Um, so for the behavioural support, um, early or initial follow-up for referral, I sometimes refer first up, sometimes I refer at the follow-up, matching to individual needs. You'll be aware of the quitline referral document. In that document, there is a space for recording what you want. Quitline has got lots of options. It, um, it will give people, obviously, NRT, but it also will um, uh, text, um, email, put people onto chat, um, chat rooms. So there are a bunch of options there. You can actually ask Quitline to do what you need them to do for your patient. So you can personalise um, the request around that as well. Um, so that's definitely an option. Um, ensuring behavioural support um, options. So uh, use of formal practice support, clinics in the practice, health checks. Um, if there's, um, you, you know, we're, we're very good at taking funding from one area where we've got it and tweaking it to make it work for some other area. We have to do this in health all the time. So if we've got um, somebody coming into the practice that we are choosing to follow up on and we've got some other process that we can link that in with, then that's a really useful thing to do. Um, quit line, as I mentioned, and local referral to um, quit pathways. Um, and just mentioning again about the texting to quit the online and the blog community for quit line. So again, this sort of stuff, you don't want to be deciding when the person's in the room. This is, this is um, a practice plan. In this practice, what have we got access to? Let's have it ready so that when I start a person on the medication, all I've got to do is either put a, put a task or print this out box or send this pre-formatted referral and it's all taken care of. I don't want to be having to put 10 minutes extra work on. So when I refer to our local service in, in Whanganui, it's, it's one outbox document. It's, it's, you know, it's this click and push and that's it done. I don't have to think about that. I, I know that that letter will contain all the information that the service needs. I don't want to be spending a lot of wasted time um, having, to, having to work out how to deal with that process. Um, for nortriptyline, um, you usually start a, a longer period before the quit date and because you've got to build, build up the medication slowly. You try and get up to 75 to 100 milligrams. That's quite a high dose, like in terms of side effects. If you put somebody with that straight up, then they're going to be pretty zonked, really. Um, so you can see how slowly you do. I usually start at 10 for most people. 
Um, sometimes you might start at 25 and just um, ease it up very slowly. But it, but it is effective and it will work. Usually the recommendation is for um, 12 weeks. Um, drowsiness and dry mouth, the anticholinergic side effects, as you know, are relevant. So this is a good product to have when um, you've, they've, they've, they can't take Zyban and they, they've used their three months of Champix up and they can't get it till next year and they're really keen. This is definitely worth, um, worth using. So how much behavioural support is needed? Um, so the research shows that uh, the more intense the interventions, um, uh, the better it is over a period of a month. Um, brief interventions, one single initial contact lasting less than an hour with no follow-up, or any initial contact plus follow-up for less than one month, does not appear effective in the research. Now, you know, research is um, about population groups. We know individuals are all different. So sometimes you're only going to get a shot at spending 15 minutes with somebody and then a couple of phone calls. That's all you're ever going to get with that person. You've got somebody um, sharing out the back of beyond. They're not going to come in and see anybody. They've got no um, other way of contacting uh, services during regular hours. So you've got to, you've got to um, work out a bespoke program for that person, really, don't you? Um, so you may have to do that. But the most um, effective is where there is a structured program, and that's what our Stop Smoking services are about. Um, they are evidence-based programs. Um, so what's involved um, with that uh, is face-to-face -face, um, counselling, um, telephone, NRT or prescription, uh, medications and um, uh, obviously combination of, of um, social media um, processes. So um, there's a lot that can be done to create successful quit support. You can see that when you're sitting in a consulting room with a person that you want to help quit, you can't provide all of this stuff. So you have to have stepped aside and say, um, how will I make sure this is going to happen first um, before I move into, um, into that? So I'll start someone on medication and make sure I've got a process in place. Um, so we need to treat the addiction. So review the treatment options, provide information, prescribe and start treatment, review and follow up. So that's the part that we've got to set up clinically and we just need to see a lot more of that happening in a very structured, safe way, um, uh, increasing access for people to medications which we know are effective. Uh, in terms of behavioural support, that's the list of things that have to happen and so I don't do that. Um, that list there, that, that, is what, that is a list taken from the recommendations for stop smoking services. This is what you have to achieve in a stop smoking service. I can't achieve that in my, um, in my consulting room. There's too much work there. So ideally, I want the behavioural support to be provided by a structured program. Because you do need that. You do need to go over what's happened before. You do have to strengthen commitment. You do have to enhance motivation and belief. You have to set a date. You have to talk about the importance of abstinence. You have to gain commitment. You have to use monitors. Um, you have to talk about support from others. You have to um, do a lot of problem solving, barriers, triggers and cues. You have to talk about changing routines, advising on adjusting medication and advising on staying smoke free and dealing with relapses. I mean that's what stop smoking services do. Those that are in the room, you would be nodding your heads and saying, yeah, that's our everyday business, you know. And that is your everyday business, not my everyday business as a GP. Um, I, can't, I can't do that. So either I have to have a nurse in the practice that's committed to a program that will do that or I have to refer to a stop smoking service. Um, but that is what behavioural support is. And that doubles the effectiveness, which is why, why we want people to be able to do that. Thanks. Um, so, um, just touching again on, on relapse prevention. Um, insufficient evidence to be sure about best practice. So we're on our own trying to work out what we're going to do. Um, uh, teaching skills to, to cope with temptations to smoke, so that's something that stop smoking services will do. Best medications for the extended use of medication, um, so that's adherence support for varenicline and bupropion. So what that means is that as a clinician, I am responsible for making sure when I prescribe these products that the person is going to take them. So adherence in this situation is actually a responsibility I have to have up front. It's no good me prescribing this medication and them only taking two or three or four weeks of it and then, and then not picking up. And yet we know that that nationally is actually what's happening because we've got the data on how much of the product is picked up from pharmacies. So this is something that we need to get a lot better at. Um, three months is the gold standard. Um, we have to work with people to make sure that they adhere to that process over three months. Um, we'll um, talk about vaping this afternoon. And social media support, I'm a huge believer that we are 
um, needing to really get into the space of social media support. Um, we're starting to see some of that from a health promotion viewpoint. We've done some work with it in our stop smoking service. We're doing very little of it in general practice um, and it's, it's just such an easy way for us to be doing stuff in general practice because you can set it up. You can set it up to happen routinely and automatically. You don't even have to actually um, be thinking about it. Everybody that's on this medication can be um, receiving messages, texting or um, Facebook or however you want to set that up. And that becomes part of the practice plan. So um, one of the things that we need to be doing about all this, as you can see, is just having a plan in the practice. How are we going to address this um, beyond just the prescribing? And I'm just finishing with this slide. We haven't really talked about the stages of change stuff and motivational work, but you can see that behind everything that we're talking about is a motivational approach. You know, um, we're talking about um, starting with people that are usually um, in a stage of contemplation. There's, there's not many people who are pre-contemplative around smoking. It'd be pretty hard to in our society, but a lot of them are in a stage of contemplation or preparation. Um, these are the people that are maybe thinking about quitting. Um, we want to get them around here action um, and get, get to get that action. So we're thinking here about you know, using our open questions, um, using the you, them, me approach, just trying to open the door and move, move people around this wheel, um, getting them onto medication and quitting, uh, which is the process of um, managing the addiction and managing the behavioural support, um, and then thinking about the relapse prevention. And for us as clinicians, that's going to be checking in with them um, uh, next time we see them. And so you can see the importance here of the linking between the services. Um, we have, I guess we have a bit of a tradition in, in general practice that we sometimes do a referral and a referral is like, okay, now that's, now that's your problem, not my problem, you know. But actually in this situation, we, we are all engaged. So we need to hear back from the Stop Smoking Service. Um, we have received your referral. Um, we are studying this person on NRT. Oh, an extra note comes through in my inbox. We've double patched your, your patient uh, and these are the reasons. You know, that's very reinforcing to me. I know it's being managed. Um, we have now completed a four-week cycle. Um, your client is now um, smoke-free. Um, next time this person comes in, would you reinforce that message? You know, it's about, um, if someone did that to me, I'd be saying, hey, I like that service, I'm going to refer more to it. You know, it's about that kind of PR. Um, but it's more than that, it's about integrating. Um, you get better results um, when you integrate. Um, so that's just a quick uh, plea, really, for, um, for planning. Planning for the individual and planning for the practice. And, and wherever you're coming from in the room, um, I'm, I'm really suggesting you've got a part in that plan to nudge it along.